I was in a rally, you know, the last rally before uh, martial law was declared or was actually implemented. This is the September 21, 1972 rally. Uh, martial law was actually implemented September 23. Ang panawagan niya na doon, mamundok eh. Directly, to confront sa tingin niya yung napipintong diktadura. He was already speaking of a Marcos dictatorship was already warning about it. Maybe Marcos was afraid that he would be able to galvanize the opposition if he were out. So to sort of you know, preempt that, he knew it. As of the 21st of uh, this month, I signed proclamation number 1081, placing the entire Philippines under martial law. Oh, I can never forget that day. I still remember it uh, very, very vivid, vividly. I was, what, 11 years old. It was, I recall the early part of the evening. My dad had a dinner with some guests. I was still small, but my sisters, it was some September, my sisters were up and their friends were over. They had a small barcada who were at the house. And maybe around 11 or 12 o'clock, it must have been around midnight, one of her, one of our friends had said, sabi niya, bibili lang ako na Yossi. said, I'll leave you for a while. So he walked out of the, our house, and then uh, just a minute later came back and his face was as white as a, as a sheet. And he said, there's so many soldiers outside. So we, we peeked uh, through the glass partition and we saw that there were I don't know, maybe 20, 25 soldiers all carrying long weapons. So I recall I went up with my sister, my dad, to knock on my parents' door to tell them that there were soldiers outside. So we accompanied my parents back downstairs, opened the door to the soldiers and went into the lanai. And the, I think it was a captain, a certain whoever was heading the unit, introduced himself to my dad and told him, I'm very sorry, Senator, but you're being invited to Camp Krame. And I remember my dad said, is this an invitation that I can refuse? And the officer very sheepishly smiled and said, I'm sorry, sir, but this is not an invitation that you can refuse. So my dad said, okay, will you give me a, little, a few minutes? I'm just going to pack a bag. And he went upstairs, I, I stayed down. And after a few minutes, he came back down. And together with my brother, he asked my elder brother to follow, to follow them. That night, maybe when they left the house, it must have been maybe around one o'clock in the morning, I fell asleep on the floor of our main door. Uh, literally on the floor, parang hoping that my, they would bring that back. So yon, that was uh, what I, that's what I remember about uh, my dad's arrest. Ironically, um, maybe 20 years later, I, I became the lawyer for a client belonging to the military who told me that it was his father who was the arresting officer of my dad and I, I told him look how the world turns you know, and now you know, you're, you're my client but he said even my father Sabinia, still remembers how what happened when he went to your house and, and arrested your, your dad so I recall my mom called up old Senator Tanyada Lorenzo Tanyada I went with her to the office of Tanyada and he filed a petition for habeas corpus 
on behalf of, of my dad and Nino Aquino. And then nagkaroon ng, ano yan, ng oral argument sa Supreme Court. In the middle of the oral argument, the court called the recess. And during the recess, the, someone was sent to Tanyada, to attorney Tanyada, and, and he was told that they will allow the families to visit. So parang in adjourn muna yung, yung hearing. And we were simply told, both the Aquino family and the Diokno family, we were simply told, you follow us. So we got into our cars, not knowing that akala namin sa, sa loob lang ng Metro Manila yung jail. We kept following them. We went go to the North Diversion Road, the Paesha and Lex Non. Keep following them. Umabut kami ng nebesia sa lawa. And that trip alone must have taken what around four or five hours. Basta mahabang biyahe yun I remember. So all of us children and my mom went, we were brought to this area. And instead of being put into a room where usually we would, we were accustomed to visiting my dad in, in Fort Bonifacio, there were two sets of barbed wire. So there was like an, a per close partition across from us, one set of barbed wire and then another one, and then we were on the opposite side. And there was a, about a foot space in between the two barbed wires. So after a few minutes, Dad was brought in from the closed partition and he looked very haggard and he looked like he had lost a lot of weight. And all the time that he was talking to us, we were only allowed to speak to him for 10 minutes, he was holding the back of his pants. So after a while, my mom asked him, why are you holding the back of your pants? And he said, oh, it only did they hurt you? And he said, no, no, they didn't hurt me, but uh, if I let go, my pants will fall. So kinwento niya, ang nangyari pala, in the middle of the night, so from his cell, from his jail cell, he was put into a helicopter, blindfolded, handcuffed to the helicopter seat, and then brought to a place where, which he didn't know where it was. Then they brought him out of the helicopter and took him into a room where everything was controlled from the outside, meaning that there was a light bulb, but the light switch was outside, all his uh, personal belongings were taken, his rosary, his watch, his pipe uh, and tobacco, lahat ng dalanya were all removed from him. And he was held incommunicado there for approximately what, 15, or more, 15 or 20 days. I'm not sure anymore of the exact number of days. So he, when we got to visit him, of course, it was a very, very emotional scene. I, we were all crying and angry and, and frustrated and he was, I recall though that of course we were also very bitter but I do remember my dad telling us that you should not hold any rancor, you know, any kind of bitterness in, in us and it was something that I can still remember up to now because he had just gone through, you know, solitary confinement and something like that. Um, so. We didn't want to finish the visit, but as the military came and said, your time is up, very reluctantly we left. And as we were walking back, I still I, I recall seeing the faces of, of Tita Cori and the children, the Aquino children, um, looking at us and wondering, you know, because all of us were crying, but angry, you know, halo halo, your emotions. And later on, they, much later on, we found out from them, yung sakwento na Manila, that when they saw us, they became even more concerned because they were wondering what, what had happened. We also found out later that when, okay, going back a bit, when, when we were talking to my dad, when we were allowed to see him, he said, where am I? So when we told him where he was, he said, yeah, I figured I was in this area from the food because I, could, I was not allowed to talk to anybody. They would leave his food. I think they had the partition that pinapasok nila yung pagkain, but he couldn't talk to anyone. He said the only reason he knew that Ninoy was with him and that Ninoy was alive was because one morning he began to hear uh, somebody in an out-of-tune voice singing Ano Bayan Ko? And in response to let Ninoy know that he was uh, there, uh, my dad said he began to sing our national anthem, of course also out of tune, because they were all sintinated. But uh, that is how they found out that they were both being kept in the same 
in the same place. After some time, I think after a week or so, they, they were brought back eventually. So they spent about a month, if I'm not mistaken, in, in that place. I remember the day was released. I will not forget that either. We got a call in the morning and we were told that that was going to be released. But we had had several experiences already before that where we got similar news. So this time we were not as excited. Siyempre, no unang nangyari yan, we really thought. No? But after one or two disappointments, we were a little bit skeptical already. So we said, okay, sige. But we began to receive more calls because other people also had received calls that their relatives were being released. So major our expectations were raised. Sabi namin, baka naman talagang mangyayari. So we rode our, we had an old van at the time. We rode it to Camp Aguinaldo. But on, when we reached Artigas, the van broke down. So we ended up even just taking a taxi. We found any way to get to Camp. However, when we got there, and the official turnover, you know, release was going to be made already, there was a, a, a hitch because all of the detainees were being made to sign a document where they sort of were pledging allegiance to the Marcos government. And when my father saw that, he refused to sign. He said, I'm not going to sign this. And so the military said, well, if you don't sign this, you won't get released. And he said, okay, take me back to my detention cell. So it, it, um, it took a while because he refused to sign and they refused to budge either. In the end, they, there was, what happened was he, he signed the document with reservations, meaning that in law, what that means is that you don't agree to everything that was in the document. And he was referring, of course, to that part about the allegiance to the Marcos regime. And naturally, as soon as he was released, he began to publicly oppose the, the Marcos government. But that was probably one of the happiest days of my childhood was the day that he was released. Even when my dad was in, in, in jail, our house became like a, an unofficial center for people who wanted to oppose the dictatorship. So you would have, on any given night, there were always religious you know, nuns and priests around. There were always people visiting who were of the same you know, kind of belief that Mark, we, should have, we have to fight this regime. And it changed us, all, all of us, children. Because prior to that, I grew up as a child of a senator. You know, I grew up in a big house. I grew up with all the privileges that my um, rich child would be accustomed to. And then one day, it was all taken away. And in fact, from being a spoiled child, we all had to learn how to make do with what was there. So I had to learn how to ride the bus. I had to learn how to do things that I had never done at all in my life. So that was one of the things that changed our, our worldview. Of course, another thing was being exposed to all the progressive, the activists, the nuns, and the priests who were at, at the time at the forefront of, of the struggle against Marcos. That, of course, was very influential to us as well.